Southeastern Louisiana University began in 1930 when the school was known as SLC for Southeastern Louisiana College. Norval Garrett was the head coach of that first team at Southeastern, and through the first three years, the Lions purred more than they roared with a 7-10 and 2 record against the likes of Amede and Independence High Schools and Mississippi Junior Colleges. In the mid-1930s, Coach Red Swanson brought victory to the Lions' den, posting five winning records and an unbeaten 1936 season against college freshmen and junior college teams. But it wasn't until after World War II that Southeastern's reputation as a Louisiana football power took shape, and the Lions truly became the Fighting Lions. For in one glorious season, that of 1946, Southeastern went from having no football team at all to boasting an unbeaten squad and the school's only bowl-winning team in history. Before the war, Southeastern's athletic program included various sports with a focus on football and basketball, the only sports for which a total of 22 scholarships were given. After Pearl Harbor, the program was one of the few in the state brought completely to a halt. But as soon as the war ended, grizzled war veterans returned to the southeastern campus with a renewed hunger. They would make their mark in history for the green and gold. We were anxious to move on, and we all could go to uh, school, whichever type of school we chose on the GI Bill. And uh, that's what most of the guys went to, you know, went to school on. on the the head coach of the Lions that year was E.L. Ned McGee, a Tulane graduate and earlier trainer and boxing coach on the Southeastern staff. His lone assistant was Clyde Funderburg, and the trainer was the legendary Grady Doc Morgan. The 1946 team captain was Pat Keneally, a seasoned Marine veteran at 24 years of age. A Bogalusa native, Keneally used his hulking six foot seven presence and bruising style to win all Louisiana honors in 1946, opponents called him the best end on the field. Keneally would go on to become a football assistant, then head coach and athletic director at Southeastern through 1971. Along with Keneally, the Lions boasted a memorable cast. The backfield included Al Romboli, Marion Wolfe, Jerome Davis, and Briscoe Dancer Dugas. The line included a little All-American and tackled Turk Campion, also manning the front was James Jug Odom, nicknamed the Big Jug of Punch, and John Mitchell, the Gretna Flash, who would go on to become a beloved science teacher in the Hammond Elementary School system. The team's fullback that magical season was Tommy McCoy, who years later would coach Billy Cannon and a Struma of Baton Rouge to state titles. I think we had a lot of good football players, a lot of good athletes. And it didn't really make a whole lot of difference who was in the ball game. It didn't weaken, you know, weaken or strengthen the, uh, the squad because we were, you know, I mean, the, the 11 guys on the playing field because we had, we had a lot of good uh, athletes. That year, all of the players were housed in Strawberry Stadium, a product of the Works Project Administration in 1937. Strawberry Stadium was where the student body and community rallied behind the football team. They have somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand students. It was a small college atmosphere, and uh, everyone basically knew everyone else. And uh, you know, they they all kind of pulled together, and, and it was it was uh, a, a center point of uh, you know what everybody did. Over a hundred players tried out for that 1946 team. But for those 47 Lions who survived the cut, the grueling practices were nothing like what they faced in the war. Well, some of the stuff we went through in, out in uh, practice that thing was kind of like a picnic for me because you should have seen some of the stuff we did in basic training and then in advanced training. Shoot, we got up and ran five miles every morning before breakfast. The Lions got a jump start on their fabulous season preseason scrimmage against mighty Tulane in New Orleans. The Lions were still wearing their pre-war uniforms, including headgear without face masks and skinny shoulder pads. Tulane had a massive squad which seemed to line up from goal line to goal line. But the first time the Lions got the ball, they scored, and it was a landslide from there on out. They didn't uh, 
see how they could uh, gain a whole lot from uh, playing Southeastern, but they did say that they would scrimmage us, so we did, and, and we handled them pretty easy. Southeastern proceeded to roll over nine straight opponents, including the Merchant Marines, the Alabama State Teachers College, and Louisiana schools like Southwestern, Northwestern, and Louisiana Tech. Most everybody that we had were very well grounded in the fundamentals of football. They knew how to block, and uh, they knew what their assignments were, and they, and they, they really uh, did a good job of carrying out those assignments. I mean, we never got uh, overconfident, but we were, we, were, we were cocky enough that we said, hey, you better look out, we're going to knock your butt off. The regular season finale came against Vaunted, Mississippi Southern of Hattiesburg, which had lost only by a single point to Auburn. Of course, they, they felt like they were, you know, they were just going to play us to fill out a, an open, instead of having an open date, but uh, they had a good football team. They were a big favorite. But uh, we beat them 20 to nothing, best I can recall. And uh, we found out, you know, they found out that there was, we were a pretty good football team. The Lions jumped out quickly before a Hattiesburg crowd of 8,000. The star was Weasel Davis, who ran one in from 20 yards out and took a punt back 62 yards for big first half scores. That win propelled the green and gold into its only bowl game in school history. Lions accepted an invitation to the Burley Bowl in Johnson City, Tennessee. We did ask this question, where and what is the Burley Bowl? Now, uh, when people people ask you that question right now, where in the heck is the Burley Bowl? What is the Burley Bowl? Well, that was the same thing we were asking over 50 years ago. And we found out it was up there in uh, northeastern Tennessee. For some of the players, the plane trip up to Johnson City happened to bring back memories of the war. We loaded up on, they had several C-47s out there. And if you do anything about being a paratrooper, which I was, as I said earlier, for about three years, we, wa we loaded up in there, and the first thing I said, where's my parachute? The Lions landed in a big way, whipping the Milligan College Buffaloes 21 to 13 to cap a perfect campaign. We didn't go undefeated because we just were lucky. We had, we had a combination of, of uh, good players, good coaching, and you gotta have some breaks along the way. Because uh, it's kinda like that old biblical saying, many are called, but few are chosen. And when you go undefeated, why well, you've got a lot of things going for you. Southeastern's yearbook, the Le Souvenir, chronicled the season. They passed, they punted, they ran through almost impenetrable defenses, and they finished in a blaze of glory. Undefeated and untied in nine games, and winners of the Louisiana Intercollegiate Conference Championship. Led by Captain Pat Keneally, who won all conference honors along with Jerome Davis, Al Romboli, Angie Antonelli, and John Mitchell, they swept every other team off its feet. The war was over. America was returning to normal, and Southeastern's 1946 Lions, truly the Fighting Lions, had set a standard that's still unmatched in school history. With their perfect record and bowl victory, the 1946 Fighting Lions set the bar high for all Southeastern football teams that followed. The next four seasons fell a bit short as the Lions didn't win again until 1950. In 1949, Southeastern pulled off one of its biggest upsets ever, a 6 nothing ambush of Auburn. But in 1951, Ned McGee decided to step down as coach, and the search was on for a new chief in Lionville. Nobody knew it at the time, but the man chosen would lead Southeastern to the highest peak small college football. Stanley Galloway was no stranger to winning. As a Southeastern winner, he led the 1936 team to an unbeaten record. He was named to the school's Athletic Hall of Fame. As a high school coach, he notched an 85-28-7 record over 12 years at a state championship at Bogalusa. Galloway's goal was to restore pride and winning to the green and gold. He stated his simple philosophy to the media. 
It takes a lot of hard work and discipline to win. The only real fun in football is winning, and one doesn't build character by losing too many games. Galloway's former players remember. He was kind of a slave driver, uh, uh, a tough ta taskmaster. You could never please him. He liked luck. Uh, he felt like if, if they saw him go to practice, that the practice was a success. Uh, he, he was a tough coach, a real tough coach. He was able to get everything that they had in them out of them, which a lot of people cannot do. So I think he just had the tools that a lot of coaches don't have. Well, he was a great stickler for detail. You know, he didn't do a lot of things, but he did them extremely well. Probably the most the most important thing that Coach Galloway believed in was perfection. And you might do the same thing 4,000 times, you know, in one week. And uh, he never s was satisfied with winning one game or two games or beating whoever, McNeese. He wanted to win them all. Coach Galloway was simple with his game plans, but very tough and uh, very uh, demanding of you to win football games. He was at the stadium sometime, 4 or 5 o'clock, get up early in the morning, come in. Uh, X's and zeros. He worked a lot with that. A uh, lot of defensive. Very, very, very smart coach. And I didn't realize this, but uh, later on in life, I found out just from visiting him at his house that he had he had plays that he grew up. And that's that was almost his hobby. Just you know, and I, he just thought about football all the time. He liked to motivate you. I know in some of the games, uh, maybe we may be behind or 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 could be doing better. We may be ahead or. or and then he has a way of coming out making these speeches that he had gotten out of texture of books and came presented to us to kind of motivate it. Our freshman year and sophomore year, he was able to do that, but our junior and senior year, we didn't hear all these same stories, you know, uh, about his, he played his game for his, his grandmother or something to that nature. You could almost tell when his grandmother was going to die, you know, and say, win one for me, Stanley, what stage in the year uh, during the season. Uh, his aunt w <coughs> would say, Stanley, you know, I'm sick. You know, you've got to win one game for me. We'd go through that a couple of times a year. And I think his grandmother died four of the five years that I was hanging around here. Galloway's methods immediately paid off. His first team, the 1951 Lions, chalked up a 6-3 and three record. After years of competing in the Louisiana Intercollegiate Conference, the Lions were now playing in a league made up solely of Louisiana teams, such as Southwestern, McNeese, Louisiana College, Louisiana Tech, Northeast, and Northwestern. Meanwhile, Galloway used his knowledge of prep football in South Louisiana to recruit top players. He added junior college players each year to fill in the gaps. He had a knack for getting a guy that hardly anybody else wanted and then developing him into a good football player. Galloway's recruiting yielded big results. His 1952 squad won Southeastern's first Gulf States Conference Championship with a 6-1-2 record. The only loss came to Division I power Mississippi Southern, 20-12. In 1953, Galloway's Lions won their second straight GSC championship, going 6-3. With a host of blue-chip starters returning, this set the stage for a memorable 1954 season. The top returnee was quarterback and team leader Ray Kuhn Porta. Porta had played at LSU in 1947 and 48 alongside Y.A. Tittle and then later in the armed services before enrolling at Southeastern. He was a heck of a passer and, and play caller. And he, he, gets, he can pick that defense up. When he gets out there on that line, he automatically change plays on the line. Exactly what they do in the pros today. We had that way back there. He wasn't that big, but he had a general in, in Ray Porter. Ray commanded. Um, if, if you didn't block for him, he let my old big Gerald Stone. Uh, Gerald was about the biggest boy in our club. Then Ray would look up at, at, at uh, Gerald Stone, he said, if that boy comes back over you again, comes back at me, I'm going to go over there and take your play. I'm going to put you back here with that ball. And finally, Gerald blocked. Whatever it took to win is what I was for. Regardless of the number of hours it took to be out there or what have you, there's nothing like winning. Porta's supporting cast featured Huey Husser, his favorite receiver, and an end who would go on to make first team All-American. He had outstanding tools. As you know, he's, he's tall, and he could run like a deer, and he could catch a football. He was outstanding. Yet the Lions' bread and butter was their running game, led by a pair of small but lightning-quick scatbacks and Don Marino and Larry Troxler. 
We didn't have a, a, a group of large people. It was mostly small, but they could really run. And our linemen could block and run as well. And, uh, and they're just a group of determined people. The Lions had physical fullbacks, Tommy Bell and Mickey Catalanata. Holding down the line was Big Gerald Stone, nicknamed The Rock. Galloway had also assembled a top coaching staff, led by former Lion great Pat Keneally and former Tennessee star Charlie Coffey. Together, the coaches whipped the Lions into shape at practice. Back in those days, we played defense and offense, and you had to be in good shape which most of our players, he kept, Galloway kept us in excellent shape. Um, he might let you go drink a beer or two every once in a while, but he's going to get it out of you come Monday morning. With all of this ammunition, the Lions seemed ready to explode in 1954, and they did, not only winning games, but absolutely demolishing teams in the process. Southeastern opened by walloping Northeast 58-0, Southwestern 32-0, and Louisiana College, 46 0. Through the first three games, the Lions had scored 136 points and allowed none. We tried to not let anybody score on us. I could tell as the game, as the season progressed, that, that we had a uh, powerhouse there. It appeared that once we started winning, you know, it, it, it just didn't quit. The desire to win and the preparation for the coaching staff in winning. Uh, it's something I'll never forget. The fourth game of the season would provide a real test for the Division II Lions. They would have to travel to Hattiesburg to face Division I power Mississippi Southern, an unbeaten club which had whipped several Southeastern Conference teams, including Alabama, for two seasons straight. They had so much depth compared to Southeastern. And uh, the years that we played them over here and over there, we stayed with them probably for a half or so, and, and, and then they just overpowered us. And they always come out to win. It wasn't by big, big, but they always come out to manage to whip up on us. In that year, we had, we had payback time. So we went to Southern. It was a sellout. Uh, a standing room, people were standing everywhere. We just knew we had a job to do, and uh, Coach said, it. This is, this is, it's your game. I've done, we've done all we can for you. If you want it, you guys got to go get it. It's up to you now. The green and gold gritters flexed their muscles early. Troxler, the jitterbug from Hanville, streaked 49 yards to the Southern 28. Four plays later, Porta found his favorite target, Husser, for a 20-yard touchdown. Mississippi Southern, outweighing the Lions 15 pounds per man, answered with a tying score. But Porta's cool passing arm proved the difference. The little field general led a 73-yard march, completing four straight passes in the drive. His 18-yard flip to Troxler hit pay dirt, and the Lions went up 13-7 by the end of the first quarter. Nobody knew that would be all of the scoring for the night. With their two-way starters exhausted after 60 minutes of football, the Lions held off a final Southern drive for the 13-7 win. It's amazing how big those fellows were to start with. I sometimes think that they must have thought it was just going to be a, another game. You know how some teams can take teams lightly which I think they just took us lightly. It's just everything that we planned to do was able to do, even though we didn't beat them by no large margin or anything. We got ahead of them, which very few teams ever got ahead of them to start with. And it looked like since we scored first that they were never able to overcome what we did to them. After four games, the Lions had allowed only seven points. The impressive victory over Southern confirmed what everyone was thinking. This 1954 team could easily go unbeaten. That's like the the Marines. They, they taught them that they're the best in the world, and, and, and Galloway put that in, instilled in us. You, you 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 can go, you can do it, and we put that in within ourselves. We did that as a team that we can't be beat. We're not going to be beat. The rest of the schedule proved little competition for the 54 Lions. They crushed Arkansas State 51 nothing. Stetson 62 nothing. East State 50 to 6 and Northwestern State 32 6. Only in a 35 24 win over Louisiana Tech did the Lions have to break a sweat. Tech was always the top teams in the league, and we beat them at their homecoming, which I don't think there, there was any, t any other team to ever beat them at their homecoming. 
And most likely they hadn't got over that yet, though, if it was still around. When all was said and done, the 1954 Lions finished undefeated in nine games, the first Southeastern team to do so since 1946. They won a third straight Gulf States Conference championship. And the way they won was unprecedented, destroying opponents with incredible ease, slashing every record in the process. Southeastern led all teams in the country by averaging a whopping 42 points per game to a measly four for their opponents. They gained 435 yards per contest and allowed only 170. Southeastern shut out six of the nine teams on its schedule. Locals proclaimed it the best team in Southeastern history. Experts throughout the state called Galloway's Lions the top small college unit in America and easily the best in Louisiana including LSU and Tulane. Famed New Orleans sports writer and sportscaster Hap Glaudy wrote, if this be treason, the best college football team in Louisiana is the property of Southeastern College at Hammond. I repeat, Southeastern is the football team in Louisiana. It has a most articulate tutor, Stan Galloway. You must give this Galloway credit. He's a sharp hombre who recognizes his spots. He selects the most opportune time to get the Lions roaring. Tulane is prostrate and LSU is collapsing. Southeastern has Louisiana's best team. Such recognition had major colleges knocking on Galloway's door. When openings at Tulane and LSU occurred, Galloway's name was the first mentioned. He went down to the wire with Paul Dietzel for the LSU job. And Galloway turned down the head job at Oklahoma State. The honors also poured in for the players. Don Marino led the GSC in rushing. Larry Troxler averaged over 10 yards a carry, and Ray Kuhn Porta was named Little All-American. 1954 was truly the year of the Lions. I think that meant everything to each of us to do what it took to do to make Southeastern as successful as it was. But Galloway didn't stop in 1954. His Lions won a fourth GSC title in 1956, with victories the last two weeks of the season against Magnese and Northwestern. After his only two losing seasons at the helm, the Lions resumed their winning ways in 1959. The 59 team featured two players who would sign professional contracts, Oscar Lofton with the Boston Patriots and C.J. Alexander, dubbed the Black Knight, who signed with the Edmonton Eskimos. The 1960 season marked a return for Southeastern to the top rung Division II football. The Lions opened the season in dominant form, winning their first seven games while shutting out four opponents. Then from there, it just kind of snowballed, and, and uh, we got to believing that we couldn't be beat, and we had a bunch of little old bitty backs. We had about five or six of them, Jerry Schwab, Billy Ladner, Joel Smith, uh, and those guys like that, and uh, they were hard to hem up. The Lions were ranked in the top five in both the AP and UPI polls. Well, winning is contagious, and, and when you start winning and you keep winning, uh, uh, losing is not an option. And we just felt like we were as good, if not better, than anybody else, and, and I think with that attitude, it made it very difficult for other teams to beat us. Stars of the team were halfback Billy Ladner, fullback Wilbur Derrick, quarterback Elbert Harris, and tackle T.C. Calmees. We had a couple of teams I forgot what they were, the white team, the gold team, whatever. And it, we didn't know at any given time which team was going to start a game. These teams were so comparable in strength that it, it was, you know, very, 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 uh, very competitive. Uh, I, I guess if we had to play each other in a regular game, theoretically, it'd be nothing, nothing. Only fierce rival Louisiana Tech stood between the Lions and their second unbeaten season under Galloway. Ranked third in the nation, it was the final hurdle between the Lions and a mythical small college national championship. Well, you got to remember Southeastern Tech were both national ranked in those days. And the year we went, 1960, we went up to Louisiana Tech, we were both undefeated and really playing for what could have been the national championship within the state of Louisiana. But Southeastern was playing Tech on its homecoming. With less than three minutes to go in the game, the Lions led 14 to 10. When Southeastern punted from its own 48, Tech's Jack Lestage fielded the ball on his own 15. We were ahead of them, 14-10, uh, late in the ball game. Uh, we punted, 
and their guy grabs in the punt. Uh, looked like we got a clip on one of our first guys down the field. Wasn't called. Wilbur Derrick, which was my counterpart within the game at the time, had got clipped on the play. And the coach Galloway, needless to say, was upset with this when he saw it on the film. But the, the referee was running with the ball carry, and he had to see the clip because it was right there. He pulls the flag slightly out of his pocket, turns it loose, and keeps running. I've been blamed for this all my life, that uh, they broke a punt on us, and I was the last guy that had a shot at him, and I didn't make the tackle. And <laughs> I have lived with that nightmare for many years. So, And, of course, Coach Galloway used to remind me of that quite often. The stage raced 85 yards for the touchdown, and the Lions lost their only game of the season, 17-14. to 14. It was a bitter pill to swallow. We were devastated. Uh, we knew we were better. Uh, we knew we should have won. Uh, and we were aware of the national ratings. And the way we lost, I guess, is, is really what upset most everybody. Because, you know, we had the game won. Uh, we made one tackle. And, and uh, chances are we would end up winning the ball game. Southeastern finished 9-1 and 10th and in the country. The Lions received a bid to play in the Tangerine Bowl, but the players declined. Hal Mees and quarterback Elbert Harris were named All-Americans. Despite falling just short of the national title, the 1960 team boasted the second best record in Lion history. The following season, the 1961 campaign, was almost a carbon copy of 1960. Well, it, you're talking about the same ball players. You're talking about the same offense. You're talking about the same coaching staff. Led by Elbert Harris and Billy Ladner, the Lions again made it to the end of the season with a perfect record. Just as in 1960, the Lions upset East Texas State and toppled Pensacola Navy and Tampa. Southeastern reached its highest third in both the AP and UPI polls. Once again, a showdown loomed with arch rival Louisiana Tech for supremacy in the Gulf States Conference. The Lions still had a bitter taste in their mouths from letting the Tech game slip away one year earlier. There wasn't a whole lot of talk about Louisiana Tech, but the consensus was, and it wasn't vocal, but the consensus was that they're coming to Hammond, Strawberry Stadium, and it was payback time. And I, I don't think Tech could beat us that day uh, with any team. Ladner took matters into his own hands, breaking a 7-7 tie with a 95-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. Ladner scored three times on the night, as the Lions tasted sweet revenge and walked over the Bulldogs 34-14. We did everything outside. We, we out-physical them, we out, we out beat them, we out, I mean, we out ran them, we outscored them. Uh, we did everything better than they did that day, just about twice as good. Unfortunately, it would be deja vu all over again for Southeastern. Once again, with a national title within their grasp, the Lions let the opportunity slip away. They suffered a letdown after Big Tech win and failed to make Nice on the road in a 21-8 upset the following week. At season's end, the Lions had won their sixth GSC championship under Galloway and finished in the top five in both polls. When you play, you know, 20 games and you're 18 and two in, in two years, that's a pretty good, good accomplishment. And we were proud of what we did. Uh, uh, again, uh, we still felt like that we should have been undefeated both years, but. It wasn't a big. Ladner was named All-American, the top back in the Gulf States Conference, breaking the single-season scoring record with 66 points. Elbert Harris signed a pro contract with the Dallas Cowboys, while Bill Johnson signed with the Buffalo Bills. After the 1961 season, Stanley Galloway coached for three more years at Southeastern. His teams compiled a solid 16-10-1 record over that span, gaining 10 all-conference selections. In 1964, his last season, Galloway's Lions went 6-3, and three, winning the final two games for their legendary head coach. Stanley Galloway's accomplishments at Southeastern were staggering. In 14 seasons, his teams went 84-42-4. Galloway took a losing program and made it not only a consistent winner, but a steady champion. In the fall of 2001, Former players gathered to honor Galloway several months before he died. Fittingly, the street that runs by the current Southeastern Football Office and west gate of Strawberry Stadium was renamed 
Galloway Drive. The tough coach left behind a legacy that might never be duplicated. I, I thank God every day that I had the, I had the opportunity to play under him because I, uh, my whole career was based on a lot of things that he had taught me. And, uh, you know, at one time we had uh, off of that 59, 60, 61 ball club, there was 10 of us that was in college coaching, university coaching at that time off of that group. And you couldn't go into high school around here that they wasn't at least one coach at that high school that had either played or graduated from Southeastern. Stan Galloway was uh, really, really respected, and he was almost hated by his players, but when they finished, they loved him, and they respected him for everything that, they, that uh, he taught them, uh, not only on the football field, but in life. Coach Galloway was a no-nonsense coach. Uh, he was hard-nosed. Uh, he was, by and large, strictly business. Uh, at the time, I wasn't really overly fond of him, uh, but since, you know, the years has passed, he's one of my, my most favorite people. Because at the time, playing for him, you didn't realize what he was trying to accomplish. He knew a lot of uh, ways to get you to do things uh, in, in, a, in a manner that he meant business when you were out there. He was the general, and uh, I respected that. And of course, these guys always said, "Man, he's the roughest coach and the meanest coach, and some of them are going to quit." But when you when you think about him as a whole, you look back today, he was like a daddy, and, and to me, uh, I'm sadly missed. Around Louisiana during the 1950s and 60s, the nickname "Stan the Man" referred not to a baseball player named Musial, but to a football coach named Galloway, the man who led the Lions to the pinnacle of success. The coach put Southeastern football permanently on the national map. When the legendary Stan Galloway retired from coaching after the 1964 season, he left Southeastern firmly perched at the top of Louisiana college football. Galloway's teams had won or tied for six Gulf States Conference titles. He was named GSC Coach of the Year four times. In 1965, Galloway passed the baton as Southeastern head coach to former Lion great Pat Keneally, his trusted assistant for 14 years. While the Lions would have only one winning season over the next seven years, Keneally's teams usually hovered around 500. They lived up to Southeastern's reputation as a hard-nosed club which could play with the best. In fact, some of Southeastern's most memorable games occurred during the Keneally era. In 1966, the Lions defeated Northeast Louisiana 14-13 by scoring on the last play of the game and completing a two-point conversion. One of the most exciting games ever at Strawberry Stadium wasn't even a Lions victory. In 1969, Southeastern barely missed a huge upset of Louisiana Tech and fabled quarterback Terry Bradshaw of Super Bowl fame. Played before a highly charged, sellout crowd at homecoming, the Lions defense rose to the occasion, intercepting five Bradshaw passes. But Bradshaw lived up to the hype, leading Tech on a last-minute, 90-yard march to win 25-24. For Bradshaw, the win avenged a 1967 loss to the Lions in his sophomore season. Bradshaw was one of four Super Bowl champion quarterbacks to play in Strawberry Stadium. Strawberry Stadium really had uh, an all-time trivia question. It was, uh, you know, what do, what do Roger Straubach and Terry Bradshaw and Ron Jaworski and Bubby Brister all have in common? And I'd say all quarterback losing games in Strawberry Stadium. Outstanding players during the Keneally tenure included receiver Dwayne Floyd and a pair of future NFL linebackers, Billy Andrews of the Cleveland Browns and Ronnie Hornsby of the New York Giants. Hornsby was a first-team All-American and a first Lion have his jersey retired. At the end of a winless 1971 season, Pat Keneally stepped down as the Lions' chief. He was succeeded by Ole Miss assistant Roland Dale, who went 3-8 and eight and 4-6 and six in his first two seasons. I think Coach Dale's organization skills and his uh, experience at Ole Miss had, uh, you know, just helped, helped us get us on the right track and, and began to build a foundation for what was to come. But in 1974, Dale suddenly left to become athletic director at Southern Mississippi. This set the stage for a successful new era in the annals of Lion football. 
that of coach Billy Brewer. Brewer came to Southeastern as Roland Dale's defensive backfield coach, a standout on the great Ole Miss teams of the late 50s and early 60s. Brewer took over a program which hadn't had a winning season in nine years. Southeast has always had a tradition of being a tough, tough, hard-nosed uh, football team, period. And, uh, and of course, I didn't uh, want to lose that tradition and was not going to lose that tradition because we were. But we weren't very talented then. We had to improve our recruiting. And our philosophy was attitude, work habits, and discipline. Billy was a great motivator. He could motivate the team to play. Billy was constantly rewarding a player here, rewarding a player there. He was tough on you, but he was compassionate. Uh, he knew how to, how to uh, break you down and say, look, if, if you're not doing the right thing, if you're not performing up to your capabilities, he, he knew how to adjust you. And then he knew how to, how to turn you back on and, and build you back up. Brewers Lions played like they were motivated. They went six and four his first season and posted winning records in five of his six years at the helm. It took us a couple more years to, to uh, uh, recruit the type kid and the quality kid that we were looking for in the size, speed, and the, uh, the ability and the quality of the player. And it all started coming together. We were a Division II school. And the there were a number of players out here that could not get in a Division I school. And we were very fortunate that we, they were good athletes, and we were able to recruit them. He had huge players, I mean, big guys that he recruited. I would say that was one of the things about Brewer's team. They were large and they were as fast. We got in the weight room, and we got stronger, we got bigger, uh, we got more self-pride and heart. And then we got, uh, we'd improve our quickness and explosion and uh, vertical jump. We had great team speed. And uh, if you pitched that ball wide on us on defense, we'd eat you alive. Brewer would need more talent to compete in Division II's brand new Gulf South Conference. For 22 years, the Lions had played only Louisiana schools in the old Gulf States Conference of the NAIA. Now the green and gold would face league foes from Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi as well. But Brewer's greatest asset was in the backfield. When he took over, he inherited possibly the greatest offensive talent in school history, a workhorse tailback out of Scotlandville named Horace the Horse Belton. In 1974 and 75, Belton put together back-to-back 1,000-yard -back rushing seasons, for which he was twice named all Gulf South Conference. In one game against Delta State, Belton ran for 267 yards on 41 carries. Heading into the 1976 season, he had his sights set on becoming Louisiana's all-time leading rusher. He had uh, uh, more than adequate size. He was about 190, 195, but great feet, quick feet, and he had great vision and acceleration. And uh, when he touched that football, he made things happen in a, in a hurry. And he could run inside, run outside. He was just a, a complete football player. To Belton's bruising style of running, Brewer added an outstanding passing attack. He brought over a blue chip LSU transfer. Then we got a great quarterback in Don Griffin, who was a super athlete, highly recruited by everybody out of Baton Rouge. This kid was a great talent, great player. He was a big, strong guy with huge hands that could run the option, strong runner, terrific passer. I mean, he threw a ball through a wall, threw it almost to probably 70 yards, 80 yards, this type of thing, but he commanded respect. Griffin had an outstanding target in wide receiver Orlando Guzman. He had a good line anchored by Jim Greer and Keen Jackson, and he had another gem in the backfield, fullback Rogers Wilson. Roger Wilson played a major role all year long because he was an explosive, compact back that would, you know, could run inside, outside, but he had the ability to break big runs because, he, you know, he was a 4 5 40 guy, had that toughness. He was a great blocker. And then and when we, you know, put the ball in his belly and, and pull it from him and, and go down the line, and then Griffin had the option of either keeping or pitching or, or whatever. So it, we, we put pressure on. on like they had never seen before. 
Meanwhile, the 76 Lion defense was loaded with stars. Linebacker Wayne Paul, nose guard C.A. Hill, and tackle Bradney McCormick led the charge. With a rock-solid defense and an explosive offense, the Lions jumped out to an unbeaten start. Big wins over Cameron University and Jacksonville State and a tie with North Alabama led to a showdown of league leaders with Troy State. It was a much ballyhooed game in which Belton could become Louisiana's all-time leading rusher with an average night of 82 yards. But the Trojans stifled Belton in the first half, taking a 7-0 lead into the third quarter. Even worse, Belton had been knocked out of action early on with a deep thigh bruise. Brewer was told his star might be out for the game. So I go to the bench, and he's sitting there. I said, Horace Wayne, we've got to have you. You are the big wheel of this game, of our football team. If you're not in there, we don't, we, we, we don't, we can't produce. He said, he said, he looked at me. I remember distinctly what he said. He said, Coach, if the wheel don't have the ball, the wheel can't roll. So I said, look, big boy, get on your feet, because we can put the ball in your hands as many times as you can handle. Belton ran back onto the field and proceeded to electrify the Strawberry Stadium crowd. The horse carried the ball 18 times for 135 yards in the second half alone, breaking Eddie Price's state record of 3,095 yards, which had stood for 27 years. Belton also broke Troy State's spirit. He scored two touchdowns in the final two minutes, won a 51-yarder through the entire Trojan team to ice the victory. Nobody knew it at the time, but Belton's thigh bruise was more serious than anyone had imagined. In the remaining six games, he would carry the ball only three more times. After the win over Troy, the Lions fell to Livingston State before winning four straight heading into the season finale against Northwestern. With Belton out, the Lions relied on great depth with Wilson and Herbie Williams at running back and an option quarterback, Dean Wagaspak. We were beginning to develop depth and depth develops competition. And in competition uh, develops uh, production. And that's what we, we had. Led by Wilson's touchdown in the final minutes, the Lions won a 34-27 shootout with the Demons to finish 9-1-1, Southeastern's best record in 15 years. The Lions came within a whisker of winning the conference title. And the honors poured in. Don Griffin was named the GSC Offensive Player of the Year. Belton became only the second football player in Southeastern history to have his jersey retired. He still holds the Southeastern record for most points scored with 202. Despite the fireworks on offense, the 76 team also won some low scoring games that season, such as the three nothing win over Delta State. It was a typical Billy Brewer team with ferocious defense. My uh, philosophy was, you know, you got to win on defense first. You got, you know, you got to be successful. You're going to have to have a great defense, and then uh, we do, we'll do what it takes on offense. But we're going to play field position football. Nowhere was this more evident than in the 1978 season. Fielding a club that went seven, three, and one, Southeastern came within a game of winning the Gulf South Conference. That year, the Fighting Lions featured the top defense in the nation. Southeastern led Division II in scoring defense, allowing just seven points per game. The unit finished second in total defense, fifth in rushing defense, and tenth in pass defense, the only team in the country to be listed in all four categories. We were known to be a rushing football team, hard-nosed, you know, hey, we're going to hit you, uh, kind of hit you in the mouth type bunch. I mean, we, 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 we're going to... Uh, just head you up and just knock your head off. That was our, they knew Southeastern was like that. And uh, you better button them on, buddy, because they're they getting off a bus now. When they get off the bus, they're ready to play. And they've they got the game face on. So we, you know, that was just self-pride. The top-rated 78 defense was led by a pair of NFL draftees, defensive end Calvin Favron and cornerback Donald Dykes. Tackle Wayne LeBlanc, nose guard Donald Myers, Linebacker Mark Stubbs and cornerback Anthony Vereen were also top defenders. The 1978 Lions wore another Brewer trademark, standout special teams. Uh, we prided ourselves on uh, uh, sudden change, which means 
uh, interceptions, fumble recoveries, block kicks. It is demoralizing to a football team. I mean, it just, it's a sudden change and you never know uh, which direction, uh, how, you, how your players are gonna react to it. It's called an emotional swing. And when we would have a turnover, intercept a pass, recover a fumble, gain field position, then we were going to take advantage of it and score. And we always sold that, and our players took advantage of it. Sudden change was way too much for Troy State, as Southeastern destroyed the seventh-ranked Trojans 45-7 in Strawberry Stadium. That amazing night, the Lions blocked a record five kicks, returning two for touchdowns. It was like 45 to seven, and the guy operating the scoreboard, every time they lined up the kick, would flash across the message saying, block that kick again. The main culprit was Albert Chapman, who blocked two kicks, recovered a fumble, and returned an interception for a touchdown. It, it was so demoralizing. Usually, when you have one kick blocked against you, usually it's, it's, a, it's a turning point in a football game. Uh, but to do this, I mean, it was a total annihilation. The 1978 record of 7-3-1 was the second best during the Billy Brewer era. In 1979, the Lions stepped up from Division II to Division I AA play, and with a tougher schedule, they began to fall at only one and four. Then, to show a recommitment to winning, the players decided to shave their heads. It seemed to work, as they won five of six to finish at six and five. Following the 1979 season, Billy Brewer left Southeastern to become head coach at Louisiana Tech where in three years he guided the Bulldogs to the 1AA National Championship game. The following year, Brewer took his winning ways back to his alma mater, Ole Miss. One of the Lions winning his coaches had departed, but he hadn't left the cupboard bare. There was talent galore for the next two years, two of the most exciting in Southeastern football history. <laughs> Billy Brewer left Southeastern after the 1979 season. The disappointment was short-lived for local Hammond fans when a hometown hero took over as head coach. Oscar Lofton, a star tight end for the Lions in 1959, who later played for the Boston Patriots, was Southeastern's athletic director during Brewer's last season. Lofton had spent six years as a top assistant at Tulane during the Greenies' resurgence during the 70s. Finally called the Big O by Hammond fans, Lofton had guided Hammond High School to its only state title in 1970. Six months after taking over the helm, Lofton decided to give up duties as AD. Oscar knew a lot of football. Oscar had been around. He'd been very successful in high school. He understood high school football players. He went in the state championship. Being at uh, Tulane, been very successful. He, he was there when the program was up and down. He understood what made a program successful. Well, Oscar had coached in, uh, in some, uh, some pretty high profile uh, programs and things, plus he had a pro background where he knew the, the passing game. The passing game, I think that had a lot to do with, us, with the success that we had. Lofton retained most of Brewer's staff, made up of former Lion players like offensive coordinator Bob Ricketts and running backs coach Ken McGee. To this mix, he brought in an old teammate former Lion All-American, and then Nickel State coordinator, T.C. Calmes, to run the defense. The Big O inherited a talented stable of skill players, led by quarterback Johnny Wells, receiver David Patterson, tight end Leslie Jackson, and backs Robert Hicks, Mac Boatner, Charlie Thomas, and Greg Damiano. Top defenders were linebacker Mark Stubbs, cornerback Anthony Vereen, and nose guard Greg Peak. We weren't selling them on uh, um, uh, this being a stepping stone, or we're going to do uh, great, greater things than we're capable of doing, but that together as a group, we could get a lot done, and that football was not an individual sport. I remember uh, how important it was for him, Oscar Lawson, to make sure that he instilled unity in, in, in the team, and by doing that, it made us come together like, like uh, one group, one big family. Lofton also stepped into a brutal schedule filled with the toughest 1AA teams in the country. 
It was the Lions' first full season of 1AA play after decades in Division II. It was 80 percent at that time of your schedule has to be 1AA or better for you to qualify. And uh, so we didn't have any choice. We had to go to Boise State. We had to play Jackson State. We had to play Texas Southern. You know, we had to play Southern. And some of those people, the people that uh, you could beat didn't want to play you. The Lions faced their biggest test right off the bat. For the 1980 season opener, they traveled to Idaho to play Boise State of the Big Sky Conference. The Broncos were the preseason pick to win the 1AA National Championship, led by an All-American backfield nicknamed the Four Horsemen. A week earlier, the Broncos had easily disposed of Division I Utah. Lofton sent Ricketts and Calmes to scout the game. When I came, when I flew back in New Orleans that Sunday morning, Oscar met me at the front door and said, what do you think? I said, we can beat those guys. He said, man, have you been smoking something or something? I said, no, why? He said, you ain't looked at the same films I did. I said, I'm telling you, we can beat those guys. I said, the team they were playing this week was the biggest, slowest team I've ever seen. I said, they're not going to be able to handle our quickness. Calmes also saw something else at the game. They automatic, 95% of their play. And I happened to get their automatic system. It took some little maneuvering and things to get it, but when... When they were warming up in, in Salt Lake City, I got down close enough to them to, that I picked up there because I'd been dealing with baseball signals and, you know, football automatics and things like that all my life. And so we decided that we was going to make them run where we want them to run. Meanwhile, Lofton tried to shield his players from the pregame hype. We had 11 guys on the field, and they had four great ones, but we could, you know, we could overcome them if we played together. We had heard all week long about Boise State. We heard that they were uh, just this great team with the four horsemen, the running backs, and, and the offensive line was just supposed to be out of this world. And, uh, uh, but I, I don't think we ever let that affect us. When the Lions arrived, they found they were playing before 22,000, the largest crowd in Idaho history. And I remember seeing these guys, you know, warming up and and man, they just look humongous. And, uh, and so, you know, the coaches kept, you know, kept us down. They, they didn't want us to get too excited. From the first snap, the Lions shocked the Boise crowd. With lightning quick blitzes and a heavy pass rush, the defense rattled Boise's high-powered offense. I remember the, the running backs were just outstanding for Boise State. But every time they got the ball, there was somebody in the backfield either myself, Mark Millette, or our two defensive ends, and it was somebody always surrounding the ball. Meanwhile, the Lions methodically moved the ball on the ground. A Wilson Alvarez field goal broke the ice for Southeastern, and after Boise responded with a touchdown, Damiano recovered a fumbled punt to put the Lions in position to go ahead. Johnny Wells then hit Bruce Guthman with a scoring pass to give the Lions a startling 10-7 halftime lead. We put it, put the ball in the end zone, went ahead by touchdown. Our guys, you know, they didn't go completely crazy and jump around and knock each other around. They kept their composure. Uh, they knew then that we could win, and I think that was a great confidence booster for us. Southeastern had limited the Broncos to minus 30 yards of total offense in the first half. The game plan on both offense and defense was working perfectly. The Lions expected the Broncos to come out breathing fire in the second half. And uh, they were used to dominating, and they got dominated, and they came out in the second half, and they thought it was going to change, and it didn't, because they got the football first, and we shut them down. And then even when they got the ball on our side, it seemed like it got tougher. The green and gold scored on a one-yard sneak by Wells for a 17-7 lead, but then had to survive a furious rally by the Bronco offense. Boise scored on a touchdown pass and moved into scoring position time and again. But each time they were turned away by the Lions' gritty defense. We stretched them just about as much as they could stand, and yet every time the defense ro rose to the occasion. Anthony Vereen's interception with a minute left sealed a giant killing 17-13 upset. It would be the only loss for Boise State the entire season. As predicted, the Broncos went on to win the 1AA National Championship. Uh, Coach Kreiner, uh, I know him pretty well now. We've gotten to be friends over the years, and 
he still talks about that. He said that was a bitter pill. That's all he remembered. I remember him telling me that was a bitter pill for me to swallow because the only game we lose is to one double A school that we thought we'd just pound you guys to the ground. In his first game as Lion coach, Lofton had pulled off the biggest upset and one of the greatest victories in Southeastern football history. It set the tone for a glorious two-year run. I think they were out to prove that we belonged in Division One AA and that we were, uh, you know, we were a good football team and on the rise. And uh, I guess that we didn't come all the way up there just to, to see a ball game. We came to play in one and we were going to win it, bring it back. The greatest thing I remember was uh, after we flew in to New Orleans, we took the buses back uh, to the athletic department. And I remember looking and down the side of the road, there were rows of people uh, just welcoming us back uh, uh, from that game. With a rough 1AA slate ahead against teams they'd never played before, Lofton's Lions were determined to prove the Boise win was no fluke. The defense once again held tough as Southeastern nipped East Tennessee 7-3 at home. But on the road the next week against Illinois State, it took a last-second comeback for victory. With the score tied 21-all, quarterback Johnny Wells scored on a seven-yard bootleg with 21 seconds left for yet another big upset. Suddenly, the Lions and their nationally ranked defense found themselves as the only unbeaten team in all of Louisiana. But their next game would be the stiffest challenge yet against Jackson State, Mississippi's Memorial Coliseum. The Tigers had tremendous physical talent turned out NFL greats like Walter Payton every year. This was evident in pregame warm-ups. The team went in and uh, Cal Mays and Ricketts and I went out on the field and we got to looking at them and we said, golly, those guys are big. And then TC said, you notice too, they don't have their shoulder pads on yet. I said, good gosh, they don't. They didn't have their pads on yet and they were giants. So I sent word back, told Doc Goodwin, don't let our guys come out until we have to, you know, because it might scare them back in the, in the dressing room. Once again, the Lions stunned an unexpected opponent early. Damiano staked the Lions to a 7-3 halftime lead with a 10-yard run. But just like the Boise Broncos, the favored Tigers woke up angry in the fourth quarter. Trailing 17-10, they began punching big holes in the Lions' defense. With two minutes left, Jackson State scored a touchdown to chop the lead to 17-16. They took a timeout to consider going for two, but decided to kick instead play for overtime. They missed. The Lions offense ran out the clock and Southeastern was sitting a perfect 4-0 on the season. A feat nobody expected considering the strength of schedule. Ironically, it was a familiar foe, Troy State, which dealt the Lions their first loss. The Trojans stuffed a fourth and one run by Boatner to clinch a 21-10 victory. Southeastern bounced back the following week at a rainy homecoming, turning for 386 yards on the ground against Texas Southern. Three runners, Mag Boatner, Charlie Thomas, and Kendall Denmark, all gained 100 yards in a 47-6 blowout. The next week, the Lions took their newfound offensive punch to Monroe against Northeast Louisiana. With quarterback Johnny Wills making play after play, Southeastern bolted to a big early lead. A successful pooch kick after the first score fueled a wave of momentum. The Lions exploded for a record 42-0 lead at halftime. I remember my Oscar being interviewed after the ball game and they asked him, you know, what do you tell your team at halftime? He said, well, I don't know. He said, I had two or three speeches where if we were seven points down or tied or five points down or if we were ahead by a touchdown or ten points ahead. He said, so I just pulled out the one that we were ahead by 14 and I read it to him three times. The Lions went on to win 55 to 30. The offensive surge continued with a 59-13 blasting of Delta State. Boatner ran for 275 yards on only 19 carries, including a 90-yard touchdown run, breaking Horace Belton's single-game record. We went into ball games where we had three or four running plays and four or five passes and won the game going away. You know what I mean? Because we executed. It was 11 guys doing their job. It was... Uh, being error free. In week number nine, the Lions unleashed a machine-like ground assault to trample rival Nickel State 35-20 at Thibodeau. The 
In the season finale, the Lions fell 16-14 to the Northwestern Demons, who were led by future NFL stars Bobby Hebert, Joe Delaney, and Mark Dufer. This 98-yard strike from Hebert was the turning point. When all was said and done, the Lions had finished a surprising 8-2 with the best record in Louisiana. Though not yet eligible for postseason play in Division I AA, the Lions had shown everyone they'd arrived at the higher level. That ball club was, uh, it's one of my favorite ball clubs that I ever coached because when they, we didn't win the conference champ, of course we won in the conference champ, but we did de defeat the national champion, so that was at least a feather in our cap. If the 1980 season was eye-opening, 1981 would be considered miraculous. We knew it was going to be a tough fight because the schedule was tough. And a couple people that we slipped up on the year before, we were going to slip up on them again. Although the Lions lost several key leaders on defense, they returned most of their firepower on offense. Well, that was kind of a roller coaster ride. It was always a lot of score. You know, we weren't we weren't as good on defense that year, but we had to outscore teams. Added to the group was quarterback Robbie Mafus, a transfer from LSU. Mafus was a Hammond native whose father Bob once played and coached at Southeastern. Robbie probably saw more of the football field than anybody ever coached, you know. He, but Robbie was very uh, quick decision maker in the pocket and had a quick release. And we always felt like we never ran, we, the game ran out too fast. We had a little more time, we could have won them all. In 1981, the Lions would again face a rugged schedule. But an explosive offense with a strong air attack would produce more thrilling, fantastic finishes than in any one season of Southeastern football history. We had enough talent at the skilled positions, both offensively and defensively, to keep us in ball games. And uh, we just had a lot of guys that, that uh, didn't like to lose. Uh, they were coming off a year, the year before, where they went eight and two. So they, you know, we had a mindset on that team uh, where they expected to win football games, and that really helped us out. Southeastern opened with a punishing ground game at Houston against Texas Southern. Behind Boatner, Thomas, and Damiano, the Lions rallied for a 31-24 win. It was an indication what the season was going to be. Whoever had the ball last was going to win, looked like. In the Cypress Mug rivalry, Southeastern held on at the end to nip southwestern Louisiana 7-0 before falling to Division II national champion Southwest Texas 35-10. It was the next game on the road against Stephen F. Austin where the Lions would begin to establish their identity as the fourth quarter kids. Somebody made the statement that said, uh, we, don't run out of, we don't run out of plays, we run out of time. You know, if, if we have one more minute, no matter if we're down three touchdowns, my boost can figure out a way for us to win. And that's exactly what happened against the Lumberjacks. Trailing 24-14 in the fourth quarter, the Lions opened things up on offense, scoring 21 unanswered points. Mafus threw for a touchdown, and Boatner twice hit Pater to win 33-24. I can remember how many measurements there were for us. <laughs> it was third and nine, and we got nine and a half, or nine and so many inches. And it seemed like it, the chains were brought over to our side right by our bench a lot. And little by little by little by little, we overcame, and little by little, we got ahead. After Jackson State got revenge 51 to 14, the Lions stood at three and two. They traveled to Alabama to face an always tough Troy State team. Mafus, injured in the Jackson State game, came off the bench down 21-3 and sparked a huge comeback. Running on a gimpy knee, his two-point conversion cut the deficit to 21-19. He drove the Lions the length of the field at the end of the game. We converted a fourth and nine or a fourth and ten. I want to think Robbie ran a bootleg and, and made one. And then we had several third and real longs that we got. And then a couple of fourth down and shorts that we got. I mean, the whole scenario was whatever it took looked like we were going to be able to get it. It set the stage for a 34-yard field goal attempt by Mark Fritcher with seconds left. All the marbles are laying on this one. It's a kick from 34 yards away. The snap's down. The kick's up. It's long enough. It's and, um, I remember all the players just running and jumping in the air and calling. Just everybody was just running as fast as they could to the locker room. And it was just a, a really exciting game. That kind of turned our season. I think we were three and two at that point. 
and teetering on the edge there, and uh, that more or less got us back on the right track. After the 22-21 win over Troy, the Lions edged Tennessee Martin 13-10 before a homecoming matchup with the Northeast Indians. Although the game didn't have much hype, it would go down as probably the greatest in Southeastern history. The Indians, wanting to avenge a 55-30 loss the year before, jumped out to a 24-7 lead at halftime. At the half, I gave a pretty blistering halftime homecoming speech, I told them. Hope all their dates ran off of, you know, <laughs> with the cassages. But the first series of the third quarter, Amafu's fumble led to another Northeast score. Now the score was 31 to 7. One of those Northwesterners blew through, and it rained for about two minutes, big old cold drops like this. And so a lot of the people on our side got up and said, well, Maybe we'll get out of this rain and get ready for the homecoming dance. 31-7, people start leaving, it starts sprinkling, you know, and, you know, it's like it's going to be one of those, you know, if we can't stop them, they're going to score 80 points on us. I had that feeling that night, and I ain't never had that feeling before, you know, but I did because it, I just couldn't see how we were going to, we had dug such a hole that we were going to get out of it. So I called everybody up together, and I don't think I said any very kind words to them, but in essence, I told them we're far enough behind now that we can start playing because we, we can't win. So we can play hard and make it look good for homecoming. At that point, Lofton abandoned the running game totally. He told Mafus to start throwing the bomb. All of a sudden, uh, I hit David Patterson with a, with a bomb down the middle of the field, and uh, it kind of got us this 31-14, uh, and scored again somehow made it 31 21 and once you get it down to 10 there's something in your mind it, it, a 10 point game is a hell of a lot closer than you know than, than, a, than a 17 in your mind anyway i mean you're within striking distance now all of a sudden it's 31 21 i turned to somebody in the press box and i said you know we got a chance to win this thing but in the fourth quarter the indians responded with a touchdown and field goal to go up 40 to 21. yet mafus kept hitting his receiver Big play after big play. And he threw it and he threw it and it was like it was going back and forth. We would score, they would score, we would score, they would score. We threw some passes and caught them and guys make great moves and they missed tackles and everything happened, you know. And I guess we, we uh, saved ourselves up. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, well, you know, we've, we've let them advance for us now. Let's jump on them and kill them. And uh, I guess it was a counterattack. Two more touchdown passes to Patterson and Todd Jones shaved the lead to 40 to 35, driving those home fans who stayed into a frenzy. To all of you fans that were at the game and are now listening on the radio, shame on you. <laughs> we scored pretty fast, so fast that they couldn't reload that howitzer down there fast enough and started shooting the cannon off. Every time we scored a touchdown, that, that, uh, that daggum cannon would go off. And I had some, some students tell me they were at their fraternity parties and stuff, and they kept hearing that damn cannon go off and wondering what the hell was going on. So it, it ended up by the end of the ball game, the stands were packed again. No sooner did the Lions score than the Indians answered with a long touchdown themselves, going back up 47-35 with five minutes left. Most thought the game was surely over at that point, but the Mafus to Patterson combo struck for a third time to cut it to 47-42 with three minutes remaining. I remember telling Mark Millett on defense when we got, we got it to 47-35 or something. You know, I said, just please, just hold them one time because they kept scoring just as much as we were. The Lion defense did hold, and Mafus drove Southeastern the length of the field, aided by a spectacular one-handed catch by Patterson at the one-yard line. It set up a game-winning plunge by Mac Boatner. After a two-point conversion, the Lions' defense held, and Southeastern had won its most dramatic game ever. I just shamed all the people that left early. <laughs> I said, shame on y'all, because some of them didn't find out until Sunday morning that we won, and they couldn't believe it. They said, apparently, they got the score wrong. I remember about 50,000 people claimed they were at the ball game, and there wasn't 10% of that there, and then uh, most of those left in the third quarter, and we got behind 31-7, to and it started raining. We had some people that left the ball game twice. We'd gotten so far behind, they said we couldn't win, and they, they left, and uh, one fella told me that he listened to the ball game, he, he listened to it, we scored twice, and they, they turned around and came back, and we got behind again, they left, and then they, we scored again, they came back, <laughs> and of course, won the ball game on 
Every who had the ball last, I think, was going to win. The Northeast win was the coup de grace of an amazing season for the green and gold. I think it uh, just proved to them and I think to everybody else that I think to us as a coaching staff that if you hang in there, you always got a chance, especially if you have an explosive offense that can score, and we had that that year. After the incredible win, the Lions went on to post two more come-from-behind victories in the fourth quarter. Mofus threw for 334 yards and three touchdowns, two to Patterson, as the Lions clipped Northwestern 21-16. A week later, they downed Southern University 28-27 before 25,000 in Baton Rouge. Southeastern finished the magical 1981 season with an 8-3 record. Again, the top mark in the state that season. Lofton was named Louisiana Coach of the Year for all universities. I don't think people realize this, but we went through the period of the early 80s that we were the winningest football team in the state of Louisiana. We had won more football, consecutive football games, more football games, LSU, Tulane, or anybody else in the state. The Lions had posted a 16-5 record in a two-year run. But they did it while qualifying for Division I AA status, making them ineligible for the playoffs. I think probably the most important characteristic that those guys had was that they, they had fun playing. Uh, they enjoyed playing. And uh, I've never heard one of them complain or gripe about how much work was put on on, on the field or anything like that. And I think this is the reason they were successful. Having come from behind in the final period to win five games, the 1981 Lions had permanently etched their name in the Southeastern football lore as the fourth quarter kids. Nobody knew it at the time, but great memories of Oscar Lofton's first two seasons would have to last a lot longer than expected. In Oscar Lofton's first two seasons as head coach, the Big O had seemingly returned Southeastern football to glory days not seen in Starbury Stadium since the reign of his mentor, Stanley Galloway. The Lions entered the 1982 season ranked in the 1AA National Top 10. They were considered the top 1AA program in Louisiana. Ironically, once the Lions became eligible for the playoffs, they didn't fare nearly as well. Southeastern posted only one winning season over the next three the brand new Gulf Star Conference. During that span, the Lions had three All-Americans, punters Brett Wright and Scott Center, and nose guard Willie Shepard. Jerry Butler became the all-time leading rusher in Southeastern history. But in 1985, with the Lions losing and the university feeling the pinch of state economic woes, rumors began swirling that President J. Larry Crane was going to drop football, dismantling a program and tradition that had stood for 55 years. As the news and controversy spread quickly, a young and winless Lion football team had an unenviable task at homecoming, squaring off with the number three ranked Northeast Indians, led by future NFL quarterback, Bubby Brister. Before a packed crowd of alumni trying to save football at Southeastern, the Lions jolted the number three Indians, 1917, for one of the biggest upsets in the country that season. And I think it proved to me, and it should have proved to a lot of other people, that there was the makings of a good football team in our program and in the kids that we had, because they proved that they could play with anybody. Yet after a two and nine finish, Crane made the decision to drop football. He cited economic reasons, expecting other state colleges to follow suit. We didn't have a choice. Either we were gonna sacrifice the academics at the university, or either, um, we were gonna, we would not sacrifice them, and it would just be a, a total disaster. It was either a library of football, and as much as I like athletics, there's not a contest there. The decision didn't sit well with football alumni, especially Lofton, who'd brought in four new assistants at the outset of the season. I wanted football to remain at Southeastern, and I wanted my kids to have a chance to play, and I felt so bad for my coaches, especially those that had come in that year, and don't, you know, we're going to get a year's of work out of it. I spent half my life, oh, just about half my life on Strawberry Stadium field. I played high school football there, college football there, came back and coached high school football there for three years and then came back and coached college football there. So 15 or 16, 17 years of my life was spent out there on Strawberry Stadium. 
And I just not, could not see how that place was going to be dark on Saturday night. I was mad. I was mad. Because, uh, 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 you know, I remember thinking, you know, you know, I've put a lot of years out here, uh, five years. I went through uh, knee operations, uh, and I went through, uh, you know, uh, broken nose, broken fingers, broke, you know, in, in a lot of sweat out on that football field. So I was, I was upset. Uh, I was extremely upset that they canceled football. You talk about football, getting rid of a football team. You're talking about some, something really serious because uh, people that have been in athletics before uh, really don't like that either. I didn't want to do that. Football means a lot to people, but I had to make a decision. As it turned out, no other Louisiana universities dropped football. Crane left Southeastern in 1986, and over the next 17 years, repeated efforts to revive the football program came up empty. Finally, enough financial support was raised in 2001 to bring football back to Southeastern. I'm pleased to say that we met our $5 million goal. Football will return to Southeastern, the North Shore, and to Strawberry Stadium in the fall of 2003. So the day they run the team out on the field, I'll give you $1,000 for a scholarship, and I'll lay down like a throw rug, and y'all can run out over top of me with your cleats on. I don't care. That's how bad I wanted to come back. The Lions would start all over against mainly Division II competition and then graduate to the 1AA Southland Conference. Southeastern hired Hal Mummy as head coach to lead the charge. Mummy, a wizard of the passing game, had successful stints at the University of Kentucky and Valdosta State winning a national title at the latter. His defensive coordinator would be Woody Woodenhofer, former head coach at Vanderbilt and coordinator of arguably the greatest football defense of all time, the steel curtain of the 1970s Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers. So on the evening of August 30th, 2003, Southeastern played its first football game in 18 years. A sellout crowd and hordes of former players and coaches were present including Lofton, the last football coach, who had gone on to scout for the Super Bowl champion, San Francisco 49ers. That historic night, the Fighting Lions rung in a new era of Southeastern football with an exciting 22-17 win over Arkansas Monticello. First score from offense, and it is Shawnee Francis with the score. But to win your opener after that long of a layoff, to win a game here at Strawberry Stadium, Everybody's going to be happy. Look, you think he just won the Super Bowl, and they feel like it down there, too. The first year back was nothing if not exciting. Despite playing several 1AA playoff powers, Southeastern finished the first season at 5-7 and seven, with several blowout victories and a ton of passing records. With a quick strike offense, a young team, and an accomplished coaching staff, the future indeed looked bright. The green and gold tradition, begun 73 years earlier, was on solid ground. It seemed like there would be more glory years ahead for Fighting Lion football. I mean, there were some great coaches out there coaching in, the, in this profession that have Southeastern roots and Southeastern background, either coach here or have played here. So the tradition of not just winning football games and being involved in winning program and getting a good education, but also being successful afterwards is there and, and has been there and will continue to be there. The family of the southeastern Louisiana is being put back together again. And uh, this one is, 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 is probably going to be more explosive than ever because uh, the 20-year lap has left such a hunger and a grasp for us to be. And that's all this school needed was to associate itself with an athletic team that's successful and now go back on the sports page.